year is 2008, and the world teeters on the brink of war. Radical ultra-nationalists have seized power in Moscow. Their goal, the re-establishment of the old Soviet Empire. Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. One by one, the nearby independent republics slip back into the Russian orbit. Russian tanks sit in the Caucasus Mountains and the Baltic forests, poised to strike to the south and east. The world holds its breath and waits. For one small group of elite soldiers, the war has already begun. U.S. Special Forces Group 5, 1st Battalion, D Company. Deployed on peacekeeping duty to the Republic of Georgia in the Caucasus, this handful of Green Berets represents the very tip of the spear, the first line of defense. Equipped with the latest battlefield technology and trained in the latest techniques of covert warfare, they strike swiftly, silently, invisibly. They call themselves the Ghosts. Ladies and gentlemen, Side Strafe back again and with a long-awaited episode of Nostalgia Night. And tonight we take a look at Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon. And not only that, but it is the original Ghost Recon that was released in 2001. But even more so on top of that, this may quite literally be the only HD footage that you will find of this game on YouTube if not anywhere else on the internet, at least in this quality. I've searched around and I have yet to find anybody who's provided any HD coverage of this game, but I'm bringing it to you, and if you haven't played this one or you don't own it and you can't view it in HD yourself, well, here you go. But on top of that, it is available on Steam, so it is easy to get if you are interested in it. But like I said, this dates back to 2001. The intro does state that it was set in 2008, but that's only a story element. It is kind of funny to look back at that, though. As you can see, this game engine does look quite a bit like the actual Rainbow Six 2 engine. It is obviously optimized for larger environments and open world terrain. This was actually the first time the Clancy series of games had brought us into a militaristic front like this, uh, which was much more outside and open world, versus the Rainbow Six series, which was more about counterterrorism and close quarter battle tactics. So the games basically played very similar. They had that same photorealistic look. They had, uh, for the most part, real world recorded weapons. Uh, one shot would still kill you. Everything was basically the same, but more based on the Army Green Beret and outdoor environments. So it was really cool to have this change of pace and be able to play this either single player, cooperatively, or, or multiplayer adversarial with the, the, you know, the tactics we love, but in this more open world environment. So this was basically the heyday of, of Clancy Gaming. We, you know, we, we came off of two awesome Rainbow Six games, and then we came here. Now, Ubisoft did actually publish this title. However, this was at the point where Ubisoft basically left the developer alone and, and hadn't yet destroyed the franchise. So this was still a PC-first title. It had later gotten a console port. Uh, but again, this to me is basically the golden age of tactical gaming and was basically one of the, you know, the forefathers of this type of, of, of game or, or franchise. Today, obviously, these games are really only replaced by games like Arma and Arma 2 and then soon to be Arma 3 as there really aren't any other realistic games in the world that, that can bring it to this level of gaming. Now, Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon aren't as hardcore or yes, realistic sir. as Arma titles, but at this point in time, uh, for example, 1998 for the first release of Rainbow Six, and then here, 2001, this was extremely hardcore realism for most people. You know, one bullet kills, three different uh, walking modes, basically. There was a shuffle mode, there was a, a walk mode, there was a run mode. You could crouch, you could go prone, and, and at this time, we weren't seeing that many types of things, you know. 
you had your semi-automatic modes of fire, burst if it was a burst only weapon, and of course full automatic. You could switch between those modes, you could switch to under barrel grenade launchers, you switch to hand grenades, uh, you could change your loadouts of your, your troops and whatnot, and, and it was extremely tactical. You had a map that you could control your units to go around if you were playing with the AI. As you can see here, we're basically just playing a single player scenario. Uh, I'm just controlling some of the AI and actually switching between the soldiers. So this kind of allows me to place them kind of like chess pieces in different areas around the map to cover different angles. I can also hold down the uh, tab or shift keys and get to a menu that allows me to use a map and set cover arcs. So very tactical gameplay. Once again, you have to have patience to be truly successful. The name of this type of game for me, of course, is to never lose a single man. And if I do, uh, like I said in my armor video, I'm basically going to start all over again. But as you see here, that's a good example. One or two bullets, and those tangos are down. And it's as simple as that. You definitely want to get closer to the ground. Keep yourself prone or crouched to get good accuracy. Uh, you'll also notice that the Clancy series of games were probably one of the first games to ever include an actual bouncing reticle and that means that when you shoot the reticle uh, shows your your recoil going on basically so that you needed to move slowly or stay low to the ground in order to keep accurate again the Clancy games uh, probably one of the first games if not the first uh, the ones that did it the best and, and it's kind of funny to think that you know here it is you know, and all the games after that have basically carried some sort of form of that. Even Battlefield or Call of Duty uh, have some form of bouncing reticle, typically, uh, if not many other games. Beyond that, the other thing that I could really mention about this game, obviously, there is no weapon model. All of the first three Clancy games, Rainbow Six 1 and 2, and then Ghost Recon, obviously had no first-person player model. And that was just the way they did it back then. Um, it was kind of an FPS sim in a way, not necessarily focusing on that. You could say maybe it was a budget reason, maybe they didn't feel that it was necessary or they didn't want to do it, but honestly, when you got into the game, you really didn't notice it and it didn't really bug you that much. Uh, nowadays, the weapon model is more of an aesthetic anyway. You don't necessarily need it, it's just there for looks anyway. But So in this game, it was just all about using that crosshair and relying on the, the bouncing reticle to, to let you know kind of what you're doing. But the other thing about this game that was just, you know, brilliant is, is it had so many features, so many things that you could do with it. You had a training mode just to go offline and, and test your skills and do things and learn the controls. You had, of course, full-blown single-player campaign. Most of that campaign could be played by yourself with the AI or, of course, cooperatively. You could play every single mission in co-op multiplayer mode with many individuals. And, and that's phenomenal. Again, 2001, and how many games these days don't want to include that? Now, yes, the single player in this game and scenarios like this are very, very simplistic. The AI is kind of just, you know, walking around and patrolling in, in simple areas. There's nothing really crazily scripted that, that would just, you know, make a co-op campaign hard to do. But, but still, the fact that it included it in some form is, is excellent. Beyond that, of course, you had your adversarial multiplayer features. Uh, back then, though, we're still obviously, you know, cable modems are still just getting popular and whatnot. And you have to basically play uh, via IP, share your IP with your friends and have them join a server and, and you're good to go. Or you go through some sort of uh, third party lobby service in, in order to play. Um, but, you know, again, we were still able to do it. I remember playing with several friends at a time and it was great fun. I believe the game had support for at least 16 players maximum, I, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was 16 at the max, uh, which was pretty decent, again, for that time. And it's kind of funny to think, like, you know, most console games, modern-day console games, could can only do 16 uh, players at sometimes a little bit more than that, but, you know, depending on the game, of course. So, again, 2001, and, and it's, you know, doing things that some games can't even do today, um, you know, especially on the console end of it. 
So beyond that, you know, it was one of those games that still just kind of, you know, your heart was always beating when you're playing this game because of the silence and the stealthiness of this game. You know, knowing that it could only take one bullet or two to drop you and it was all over. And if you lived from a shot, it usually left you wounded to the point where your accuracy was affected if you took an arm hit or your leg. If you got hit in the leg, you would basically start limping and moving slower. So nowadays, find a game that kind of does those things other than Arma. Yeah, good luck. It's not happening. Most people, once again, are afraid of a challenging game or a game that brings realism into your living room. And, and this is, you know, just one of those games that you look at it and you look at the amount of features that it had and compare it to newer Ghost Recon games. Um, you know, dating as far back as even Ghost Recon 2, I think, started messing with the formula, which was even a console-only game, and then it just got worse after that. Uh, because later on, the PC became the platform that got the ports from the console when it came to Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter, which was basically just trash. Uh, as far as the PC versions were concerned. And it's really, really sad and frustrating for somebody who's seen these types of games and all the people out there who loved and spent hours playing these amazing games just to have it, you know, basically destroyed. As you can see here, headshot with the sniper rifle. And I'm basically positioning characters in uh, strategic points around this castle facility here in order to get some good shots you can see I've got the sniper up on the wall I'm trying to get some guys through the windows and then I'll have my other teams move in uh, for some close quarters action so as you can see here we've got outdoors and indoor environments that we can uh, interact with which is which is really just great and a whole lot of fun and the other cool thing about multiplayer is like this is a single player scenario but I could play this map in multiplayer I could play all the single player maps adversarially multiplayer uh, that includes normal single player that even includes obviously the the custom made PvP um, basically maps and and it's cool that they give you that option because if you look down the map list that you had it was huge if you include all the single player stuff sometimes you'd spend you know a whole lot of time trying to look for another player but you know that sometimes that that was part of the fun and of course there was no respawning so if you were out it's time to basically go into spectator mode and root for your teammate to uh, win the game for you. But uh, as I've mentioned in the past, uh, it's, it's my firm belief that Ubisoft had a hand in basically hurting this franchise. This game uh, was still at this point made by Red Storm Entertainment of the United States, which all three first titles were of that Red Storm company that was partly created by the author Tom Clancy. Uh, at which point after this, I believe when Ubisoft picked it up, uh, Raven Shield, which was Rainbow Six Three, was then developed by a company either in Canada or France, uh, Ubisoft Montreal, I believe at the time. And at that point, Raven Shield was a good game. Don't get me wrong, Rainbow Six Three was still pretty good. It, it was after that that things started to fall apart. And I think we can blame Ubisoft for kind of wanting to get more into what I call a Hollywood shooter, which is basically unrealistic, uh, third-person perspective, you know, kind of cheap gameplay. And honestly, it's just, like I said, really, really sad uh, to, to see the core gameplay just change based on the fact that they thought that their audience wasn't going to continue to appreciate this type of gameplay. They thought and they listened to feedback from many other individuals that said, oh, you should be able to run faster or, or shoot faster or, or you should be able to live longer and not take so many hits. But then they don't realize that half the people that are complaining that are just, you know, immature individuals that just don't understand that this is supposed to be a separate genre. You know, if you wanted to play a game where you live after taking, you know, 50 bullets in the chest, then you should probably play Quake or Unreal Tournament, you know, and that's what we did back then. We played those games instead of this game if we wanted an arcade mode. But nowadays, as you play, even, you know, one of my favorite games, Battlefield, as, as much as I like Battlefield, it's very arcadey. Uh, of, of course, the king of arcade Hollywood shooters is obviously Call of Duty, which, in my opinion, is actually even worse in that in that scenario. But you know, to each their own. 
everybody's going to like their, their different type of gameplay. It's just that it seems that most people want, for some reason, a modern-day shooter where you're in the military or special forces, but you're, for some reason, taking half a magazine into the face uh, and still living. So, even though that's an over-exaggeration, that's basically how I feel about it, you know? And, and honestly, I just think that those things should remain separate. And this here, my friends, is, is the true example of the way it was meant to be played. You know, creeping through here, stealthfully taking out my objectives and completing missions. It's called Ghost Recon for a reason. You're a ghost. For the most part, you're supposed to remain unseen, stealthy, you know. You're doing surgical strikes here, taking people out with one bullet, maintaining high hit percentages, you know. I remember used to play this multiplayer. I would look at the end screen and it would show you hit statistics, your percentage of hit, uh, how many rounds you fired. And most of the time I wouldn't have had to reload a single magazine because you could take out individuals with a single shot and that's all it, you needed and sometimes you wouldn't even go through half a mag because that's what it took, you know, to take out an entire team. Maybe we played against eight other people, eight bullets. If you think about it, if you're hitting your marks eight bullets to take out those eight players, you know, give or take a couple of rounds if you're hitting, you know, uh, limbs and whatnot. But this is how this game was played. And, and I just, like I said in my Arma videos, I believe that, that patience is, is lacking these days. And I'm just kind of not sure, uh, you know, where, where all the fans are going. You know, if you think about it, I know people like me, you know, are playing... Games like uh, Arma now, nowadays in hardcore mode for Battlefield 3 and trying to get their realism out of it. But it, it's, it's sad to think that the community doesn't appreciate this anymore, or at least that the developer and publisher thinks we need to make games where you run around and, and, and fire all kinds of crazy guns that would kill people in one shot uh, with, you know. So... Almost coming to, to a close here, I have to conclude in saying that, you know, honestly, this game is still very playable. Now, yes, if you are the type of person that wants to, you know, have a graphics-intensive game, like, trust me, I'm picky about my, my graphics as well, but, you know, honestly, this, this game, you know, if you can find it on sale, once the Steam throws a good sale out, this game is worth like five bucks, you know, to pick it up. It's actually even worth more than that, but it'll probably Another go on kill. sale for le for much less. And uh, you could definitely pick it up. But uh, as you can see there, guys, mission accomplished, zero casualties. The hit percentage is ranging uh, from 45 to 75 to 100 percent with very few shots fired. And that's the way you do it, my friends. And, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this classic look at Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon. Uh, please leave your feedback, questions, comments, or concerns. And don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe to the channel. I will see you soon. Take care, guys.